It's been estimated that most people speak enough words in one week to fill a 500-page book. And I brought a visual aid with me this morning to give you some kind of idea to let you know how many words most of you speak in a week's time. This book is just a little over 500 pages. Not much, though. In fact, that illustration I read said a, a large book of 500 words, so this is kind of a medium-sized book. But I want you to just think about that for a moment, that you speak enough words in, in one week's time to fill a book like this. Now, over a lifetime, based on the average lifespan, you could speak enough words on average to fill 1,500,000 pages, 3,000 volumes. You're pretty much going to speak a library over your lifetime. That's a lot of words, is it not? Words are very important. We're very, very blessed to have the gift of speech, how we can communicate with one another and let each other know how we feel and what we think and and we can build things, and we can go places. We can do all kinds of things because of human speech. Every week we're writing words. Every year, every decade, the words keep coming. My question to you this morning is, what kind of words are you writing? If we could put all your words in a book, what, what would the subject be about? Would your words... Would your book be juicy? Would there be some scandal in your book? Would there be some obscenity in your book? What kind of words would be in your book? Several years ago, there was an advertisement on the radio, and it was advertising some material that would help you build your vocabulary. It was called Verbal Advantage. You may have remembered that. Supposedly, it would teach you a thousand power words to help you when you go for a job interview, or it would just help you get ahead in general in the business world if you knew these, thousand, these, these power words, a thousand of them. And one of the slogans that went along with the advertisement is people judge you by the words you use. You know, they think you're really smart if you use a lot of big words. If you have a big, vast vocabulary, people are going to be impressed. That was the idea. So I assume people do, in some respects, judge you by the words you use. But most importantly, do you realize that God judges you by the words you use? I want to share with you this morning a very sobering passage from Matthew's Gospel. Matthew chapter 12, and we'll start reading in verse 33. Matthew 12, 33. And let's take a look at what Jesus has to say about the importance of words. 12.33 of Matthew's Gospel. Make a tree good and its fruit will be good. Or make a tree bad and its fruit will be bad. For a tree is recognized by its fruit. Now keep in mind, he's not necessarily talking about trees. He's comparing people to trees, so keep that in mind. Then in verse 34, he says, You brood of vipers! How can you who are evil say anything good? Now he's talking to the Pharisees. He's not talking to the disciples. I'm glad he's not referring to his own followers as a brood of vipers. But he's talking about these Pharisees who in context have been slandering him. Keep that in mind. For out of the overflow of the heart, he says, the mouth speaks. Verse 35. The good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him, and the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. But I tell you that men will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every careless word they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. Wow. Man, if that doesn't set you back on your heels. Man, our, our words are powerful. Our words are going to have uh, some impact, you might say, on the day of judgment. You know, I can imagine the big finger of God coming down and hitting the celestial uh, tape recorder, I guess, some kind of recording device, and, and I'm getting to hear all the things I said over my lifetime. Whew. Well, Lord, I didn't mean to say that. Well, I didn't think anybody would care. Well, they didn't know I said that. You know, can you, can't you just hear all the excuses that, that only I would make, of course? No, we all would be making, you know, it's going to be a sobering time to have to 
recount what we've said and, and, and why we said it. And he says, we're going to be held accountable even for every careless word that we've spoken. Now, at first, a careless word, you know, I'm thinking like, ah, uh, yeah, bleh. you know, that's, that's not the idea here. Careless word, this word careless uh, carries the idea of uselessness. It, it carries the idea of uh, being non-productive. It was a word used in the Greek language to describe a barren, fruitless tree. And that fits well in the context because he's been comparing people to trees. He said, you know, a good tree bears good fruit. The idea is that a good person speaks good things and a bad person speaks bad things. That's what he's saying. You'll, you'll know them by their fruit. He said that in another place. So he, he's telling us here that we're going to be held accountable for all the words that we speak that are unproductive, that are useless, that are good for nothing. Words that don't do anybody any good. God expects us to speak words that are uh, fruitful, words that help others, words that build up others, not words that tear down and hurt others. He wants us to speak good fruit words, if I can put it that way. So, so what would be some unproductive speech? You know, when I survey Scripture, I can find all kind of unproductive speech that's pretty much condemned from cover to cover. First one, right off the top of the bat, there, there's lying. Lying is certainly unproductive. It doesn't do anybody any good. Uh, it's the opposite of who Jesus is. Jesus is the way and the truth. You see, when, when we lie, we're about as counter to Jesus as we can be. Jesus says that when, when people lie, they're speaking the devil's language. Whew. Lying has no part in a Christian's mouth. We should not be people who speak lies. We're supposed to be people who speak the truth. And when we lie, we're talking the devil's language. Slander is another form of unproductive speech. There are two words translated as slander in the New Testament. One simply means to speak evil of someone. King James Version translates it as backbiting. It is mentioned in Paul's list of wickedness in Romans chapter 1, 29 and following. He gives a long catalog of sins there. And, and um, you know, slander is right in there with it. It keeps company with some of the vilest behavior. The other word for slander comes from the Greek word diablos. From which we get our word devil. It gives you an idea of just how unchristian slander really is. It, it, it's, it's counter to what God wants us to be speaking. Slander is when we're speaking evil of somebody else. You could say slander is demonic, just like lying. Gossip is another form of unproductive speech. This word literally, literally refers to a whisperer, but not just any old kind of whisperer. It refers to the slanderous whisper. The gossip is a kind of Scan, uh, scandal monger. Maybe like a walking around National Enquirer. You know, somebody that just loves to carry tales about other people. I suspect it's because they have low self-esteem and they want to tear others down so they can feel equal with others. I, I, I get into the details if you want to and get in psychological weeds, but I don't want to go there. Uh, sometimes I think, well, not sometimes, I think people, listen, we need to work on being responsible for our own behavior and quit looking for excuses. I mean, excuse making goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. You know, it's that woman, you know, it was that snake, you know. It's like, so we, we need to get beyond the excuses and work on the behavior. Gossip is, is another form of unproductive speech. It's right there in the category with slander. And again, in the context where Jesus is speaking there, He's, he's talking to these Pharisees who are engaged in, in slander. Theirs is not very gossipy because I don't get the feeling that they're whispering about it. But Jesus is performing these miracles and he's casting out demons and they're saying, oh, he just does that by the power of Beelzebub. That means the Lord of the flies, Lord of the dung heap. You know, they're, 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 they're really, they're really um, putting Jesus in a bad light. They're saying he's evil. He's demonic. That's certainly a scandalous, slanderous language. And it's in that very context he talks about out of the heart the mouth speaks. 
He said, that just reveals what's in their heart, all this, all this, this uh, slanderous speech that's coming out of their mouth. It's bad. It's unproductive. It's not doing anybody any good. But back to the gossip. Gossip tends to ruin relationships. I think that's one of the reasons the Lord hates it so much. Gossip, it just, it just drives people apart. God's wanting to bring people together, but gossip has a way of doing just the opposite. Solomon tells us in Proverbs 16, 28, a gossip separates close friends. Proverbs 26, 20 states, Without wood, a fire goes out. Without gossip, a quarrel dies down. You see, if you have a lot of strife in your life, there's probably some gossip going on somewhere. Some kind of speech calling someone's character into question. Arguing is another form of unproductive speech. Philippians 2.14 tells us, to do everything without arguing. Some of you are thinking, is that possible? You know, arguing is just, just a part of who you are. That's a problem if you're always uh, engaged in some kind of verbal combat with somebody else. Scripture tells us not to be that way. And some people may push your buttons and know just how to get you going, but you need to get beyond that. God does not want us to be argumentative people. Because oftentimes... Arguing leads to division. And a person that's argumentative tends to be a divisive person. And that's really serious. Again, God wants to bring people together, not drive people apart. Listen to what Paul writes in Titus chapter 3, verses 10 through 11. Pretty strong language here. He says, warn a divisive person once. He's talking about people in the church. And then warn him a second time. After that, have nothing to do with him. You may be sure that such a man is warped and sinful, he is self-condemned. Wow. Man, that gives you a good idea of what God thinks about argumentative, divisive people. Complaining is another form of unproductive speech. Uh, also in Philippians 2.14, we're supposed to do everything without arguing and complaining. Now, if you want a good lesson on how God feels on complaining, just, just look, go back to Exodus where, where the Israelites are coming out of Egypt. Moses was leading them, and I mean, they started griping almost right off the bat. They're griping about the food. They're griping about what they're drinking. They're griping about the harsh conditions. They're griping about Moses and Aaron's leadership. Just griping and complaining and griping. And, and some of them ended up getting killed because of it. And furthermore, the Apostle Paul tells us that, that this was all written down. It says in 1 Corinthians 10, 10, and, and 11 that that was written down for us as an example. God does not want us to engage in that kind of behavior. You see, complaining is uh, a form of ungratefulness or a spirit of, of ingratitude. When we complain, we're not being thankful. And God really is looking for people who are appreciative of His blessings. Just like when you do something nice for someone, you, you appreciate it if they thank you for it. It's much the same way with God. But when we complain, it's the opposite. Bragging is another form of unproductive speech. It indicates that uh, we definitely got some heart problems going on. You know, James 4.16 tells us that boasting and bragging is evil. I'm sure we've all been around people who like to toot their own horns. Uh, you know, I've even heard people say, it ain't bragging if you can back it up. Well, yes, it is. It doesn't matter if you can back it up. It's still bragging. You see, bragging is a form of self-exaltation that springs from pride. Once again, the opposite of God and Jesus. Jesus is the epitome of humility. Pride is at the opposite end of the spiritual spectrum. Satan was a proud creature. See, it all, all this unproductive speech is, is really demonic. I mean, we, we live in a world where it's just, I see bragging just so much on, uh, you know, on TV, especially in the sports world. I've, probably the world's worst place for bragging is, is wrestling, if you want to call it that. I mean, they, they, they pretty much love to brag about what all they're going to do to the guy when they get him in the ring. Sometimes in boxing, you see some of that. and In football, you know, the wide receivers, they're all prima donna. They're always, you know, kind of bragging. And even on the fields, they engage in it. We, we call it, uh, some of it we call it trash talk, which I think is a very good description because it is trash. God does not want people engaging in, in, in braggadocious speech. 
about what all we can do and what all we're going to do. Filthy talk is another form of unproductive speech. Uh, the Bible tells us in Ephesians 5, 4 that there should not be any obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking among God's people. We're not to be engaging in telling dirty jokes. And now we're not supposed to hang around and listen to it and laugh either. Several years ago, I had a friend call me. I hadn't seen him probably in 20 years. Uh, he'd been on, been in the, he's in the Navy, and he's working on board in aircraft carriers and servicing jets. And he was there when they bombed Afghanistan one of the times. And, you know, he was just going on about how he had gone all over the world. I guess he was wanting me to kind of admire him. He was in Virginia Beach at the time. And he was just telling me all these stories, but his, his, his speech was just laced with filthy language. I, I learned where that expression comes from, curse like a sailor. That was him. And then when he started talking about his female encounters, I had to tell him to stop. Whoa. You know, usually when people find out I'm a preacher, they'll, they'll, they'll calm it down a little bit. He didn't. He must have had old memories from me in the past or something because he was just going on and on. I, I finally had to tell him to knock it off, you know. But what, what makes matters worse is after all that, and I started trying to get this thing turned in a more spiritual direction, he went on to tell me, yeah, I was in Israel. I went to the Jordan River and I was baptized where Jesus was baptized. I said, man, you sure don't talk like someone who's been baptized. And he got a little irritated. He assured me he was going to heaven because he believed in God. Now, the reason I tell you that story is sometimes we can go around thinking everything's okay, but what's coming out of your mouth is revealing what the true condition of your heart is. We can go around acting and thinking one way, but what's, what's your mouth saying? What, what is flowing out of you? Never underestimate uh, the power of your words because not only do they have a great effect on others, they also reveal what's in your heart. Your words show the condition of your, your true spiritual self. I mean, we're really getting a window into the heart of others when we hear them talk. You know, James compares the tongue to something that's small but has great power. He compares it to the bit you put in a horse's mouth. Now compared to the horse, the bit's pretty small, is it not? But yet that bit controls the entire animal. He also uh, com compares it to the rudder on a ship. You know, the rudder, compared to the size of the ship, it's not very big. But what does the rudder do? It steers the ship. And he compares it to a spark, a little bitty spark, yet it can start a forest fire. We can compare it today to a steering wheel on a car. I mean, it's just relatively small compared to the rest of the car. But man, you, you can steer the entire vehicle anywhere you want to go. It's small, but it exerts great power. You know, I think back to when I was in high school. Some of y'all heard me tell this before, but I always think of this when I think of something small controlling something larger. I took this agricultural class, and part of the responsibility of the class had a project in the class and part of the project involved raising up a, a calf and teaching it how to walk around. You'd actually teach it how to walk and follow you around like a dog. And it would, it would be on a, a rope, have a halter on its face, and, and you'd lead it and make it stop. And you had this little stick, and you'd, you'd put it up under its belly, and it'd raise its belly up. And it, you know, it's back. It, 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 you want it to look kind of like a boxcar. And you could get that calf, and then you'd do things like a, it had horns. It was dangerous too. It had horns. You, I'd sand them down with sandpaper, put some clear fingernail polish on them, make them look real shiny. Had to tease the ball on the end of the tail. There's all kinds of stuff you had to do. But the first thing you had to do with that calf was teach it to follow you around. That was a huge deal. Because if you couldn't get it to follow you around, you weren't going to get anywhere with it. And I had two of them. One of them went pretty well, but the next one that came along, it was stubborn. I couldn't do anything. I, I'd pull on that halter. It wouldn't move. It'd just look at me with a big old black glazed over eyes. It'd do its head out there. It wouldn't move. Just stubborn. I'd pull and pull and it wouldn't do anything. It was a lot stronger than I was. So one day I got the bright idea. I said, you know what? I'm going to tie this, this, this halter rope to the back of my pickup truck because I, I got more horsepower right there. And we're just going to pull him real gently so he'll get the idea that he's supposed to follow this rope. Sounds like a good idea, doesn't it? Because I wasn't strong enough to do it. 
So I just tied up to the truck. So I tied the rope to the back of the truck and I gave it a little gas and he still didn't move. I gave it a little more gas. All four legs locked up just like that. Still wouldn't move. And then, then I pulled some more and his neck got out through. Like that. I was like, this, this is the stubbornest thing. I said, all right. So I said, boom. I gave it some gas and that thing went boom and fell over and it was dragging it down the gravel road. He said, Jan, you shouldn't have done that. But, but I, I was thinking, well, it'll get the idea. It never did get the idea that way. And, and it wasn't really my calf. It was somebody else's. So I was abusing this other guy's calf out there. And I went to the guy and I said, you know, I cannot get this, this thing to follow me. He said, all you got to do is put a ring in its nose and it'll go wherever you want it to go. I said, yeah. Sure enough, put this little ring up in that calf's nose and just barely pulled and it just went right where I wanted it to go. I was amazed at that. That little ring had so much power over that entire animal. I guess their nose is real tender right there and that gets their attention. But my point is it's small, yet it, it, it helped guide that entire uh, calf around. And that's what James is saying. Your, your tongue is small, but man, it exerts a lot of power. You know, it's, it's kind of an extension of your heart. You know, it, it's, it's, it's kind of showing uh, what kind of person you are. And your words, like a spark, can set something on fire until it's an inferno. So our words are very, very powerful. Two things there. They, they reveal what's in the heart. And they, they, they can uh, bring about some, some negative Results if used in the wrong way. Now, on the flip side of that, if you use your words in a, in a good way, you can do a lot of good. Listen to what Paul writes in Ephesians 4, 29. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Your words can actually build somebody else up. Now the flip side is your words can tear somebody down. And the bad thing about that is negative words can stay with somebody a lifetime. I can remember words said to me that, that I wish would never said to me that I can't get out of my head. They're just there. I've heard it compared to like uh, shooting an arrow from a bow. Once you release the arrow, it's gone. You can't make it come back. And words are a lot that, like that. They can tear people down, but on the flip side, words can also build people up. He said, only, only let words come out of your mouth that are helpful, building others up according to their needs, that it will benefit those who listen. As, as Christians, our, our book, incidentally, I, I thought this was ironic. I didn't plan it this way. I looked on the side of this book here, and it says, Nigel Turner, that's the guy who wrote the book, it says, Christian words. I thought, that's cool. That's just full of Christian words. Well, you know what? That's the kind of book you need to be writing. A, a book full of Christian words. And good Christian words are words that help other people. Words that encourage other people. Words that build others up. I think of Barnabas in the New Testament. He was called the son of encouragement because he was someone who went around encouraging other people. And everywhere you found Barnabas, you found a healthy, growing, thriving church. Why? Because he was someone who benefited other people with what he says. What kind of things are you saying in your house to your spouse or your children? Are you speaking positive, encouraging words? Or are you speaking words that tear them down and belittle passive-aggressive comments? Things that make people feel bad. Be careful about that. God, God is going to hold you accountable for every unproductive word you speak because those words have a detrimental effect on others. God wants you to speak words that encourage and build, not tear down and destroy. Proverbs puts it this way. Pleasant words are a honeycomb. Sweet to the soul healing to the bones. I like this. A word aptly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver. Powerful words. Words are powerful. Colossians chapter 4, verse 6, Paul writes, 
Let your conversation always be full of grace, seasoned with salt. He says always too, not just some of the time, not just when you're at church, not just when you're around John, but, but always. Always let your conversation be full of grace, seasoned with salt. Well, what exactly does that mean? Well, salt was used to season food in biblical times, and it was also used to preserve food. The idea here seems to be that our speech, our speech should be properly seasoned, pleasing, and pure. Not bland and dull and rotten. Make sure the words you speak are words of life. Words that help. Words that build up. And please take this, this message seriously. Please, when you go home today, try to work on your speech. Try to get into the habit of, of, of speaking things that are, that are good and, and positive. And just, just before you say something to somebody or about somebody, ask yourself, well, why am I saying this and will it do any good? Is this going to help anybody out, me saying this? And you know what? Everything I've said today, everything I've said today can be applied to social media. You want to see some filthy, rotten talk? Just get on Facebook. There's some all kind of braggadocious, all kind of stuff on there. It's really, it's really, really a turnoff sometimes. Watch what you post. Watch what you send on that you're forwarding on to somebody else. Because like it or not, people attach that to you. Oh, yeah, I could, I could really talk about things here on politics and things like that that I see. But please cut down on stuff that's divisive and pushes people apart. Why are you doing that? Post things that are positive. Things that are good. Not things that's divisive and cause problems. I'll end with this quote from Charles Spurgeon. He said, What lies in the well of the heart will come up in the bucket of speech. Hi there, I'm John Wagner, minister of New Discovery Christian Church here in Hernando, Mississippi. And I want to thank you for visiting our YouTube channel. I do hope you enjoy the sermons and I hope the Lord builds you up through His Word as I do my best to present it to you. If you're ever in the area, feel free to drop by and check us out live and in person. Once again, thank you for checking out our YouTube channel.